Welcome to the Teaching Journeys podcast, hosted by Dave Roberts. Humanity possesses a unique skill, the ability to pass knowledge from one generation uh, to the next. This podcast embraces that ability, offering learning opportunities through conversations with extraordinary guests. Dave aims to leave a positive mark on individuals around the world. So before you dive into today's episode, please share this podcast with your network, including friends, family, and colleagues. And please consider leaving a rating or review. Your support makes all the difference. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Teaching Journeys podcast. I am your host, Dave Roberts. My guest today is Tanya Marie Belarjan. As the CEO of the Ginger Bros LLC, Tanya is on a mission to help a million people revolutionize their cancer journey, moving them from mere survival to full-on thriving. She's your go-to guide, helping cancer survivors adopt the winning mindset, build a powerhouse support team, and explore effective alternative wellness modalities. Working hand-in-hand with your oncologist's treatment plan, she's determined to help you vanquish fear, reshape your mindset, and unleash your inner warrior. Tanya's goal? To help you not just endure, but flourish. With her by your side, you're not just surviving cancer, you're conquering it. And with that great it's bio. I'm all in, Tanya. So welcome to the Teaching Journeys podcast. It's a great having you here today. Thank you, Dave. I really appreciate you having me on the program. Oh, it's my pleasure. And as we were talking before we went on the air, um, just your history resonates with, with my personal history and your journey in general. So I, when when we first uh, discussed you coming on the show, it was just like, yeah, this is going to be a great match. And I think my, I know my viewers are going to get a lot out of this. So the first question that I have for you is please tell our listeners about the experiences that have shaped your life path. Uh, well, n- nothing impacts your life like receiving a cancer diagnosis. And I, and I do think that this is the most defining moment in time for me personally, because it radically changed who I was. Uh, I became a much more compassionate, caring individual. Um, and it filled me with gratitude. Not, not immediately that, that took some time, but it, it life altering is when you receive a diagnosis that, you know, when they tell you you have about a 5% chance of survival, it really changes very uh, so many things in your head and how you conduct yourself. And it prioritizes, prioritizes your life like nothing else can. Yeah, and, I, and I've talked to numerous cancer survivors who've told me that just having that diagnosis was life-changing. And as a survivor... They've learned to just value every day of life just more strongly. They live it more fervently with purpose. And I think it really alters one's worldview as much as experiencing a a physical loss, a loss due to death that defies the natural order of the universe. Um, I think everything changes. Like you're right, when you get that type of life-altering diagnosis, it's um, it really... uh, causes us I, causes us to, to think and to reprioritize and to take a look at what really matters in life. I do work with cancer survivors and when I when I speak with my clients and individuals that I interview on my podcast about the moment that they were they are diagnosed, mm. uh, there is a communal like lack of breath, right? Like you stop deep breathing. And so one of the first things that I like to do is breathing exercises so that you can take your first real breath again, because I think that is super important because, you know, just like let it out and, and really breathe again, because it is so overwhelming. It's like a, uh, emotional and 
it, it's a trauma bus. It runs, it runs you right over is basically what happens. Like you're, you feel like you're hit by something physically when you receive that kind of diagnosis. Yeah, literally, I think, takes the air out of you when you get that. And, you know, literally and figuratively. What was the type of cancer you were diagnosed with? And I, I, I have it in front of me, but I, it seems like it would be a very rare type of cancer that you were diagnosed with. So I, I'm going to start with the fact that, that most people don't know that a healthy uterus is four ounces. So I was diagnosed with a carsosarcoma, which is actually two different kinds of cancer. And when they removed my uterus, it was over 10 pounds. That look is exactly right. There were no markers in my blood. My uh, pap smear and the ultrasounds, the transvaginal ultrasound is something called a sonohistogram, which is where they um, inflate your uterus with saline and then they image it. All of those things came back negative or inconclusive. In order to find my, my cancer, they had to do a DNC, which is removing the lining of, of the uterus. And that's where they found the cancer cells. So one of the things that I really advocate is listen to your body. And when you know something is wrong and your doctors aren't listening, you have to advocate for yourself because while they are very learned, lo lots of schooling, and they're very educated, you live in your body 24 seven. So if you're, if you know that there's something off, then pursue that until you get a real answer. Our body will talk to us, I think, in ways that we could never imagine. And the body, I think, informs the mind. The mind informs the body. There's that mind-body-spirit connection that we can't deny. And, um, and I, think we need to, I think it's important that we get up, we scan our bodies every day, we see what's hurting, we see what seems to be out of whack, and then honor that and determine whatever holistic or traditional practices we want to engage in to begin to address that. But yes, our body can guide our intuition and our intuition is something that we should not deny at all. Yes. Sarcomas are a very rare type of cancer. Um, and I'm, I'm speaking of this because, you know, before we got on the air, I talked about my daughter, Janine, who transitioned as a result of a, of a rare type of muscle tissue cancer sarcoma called avelia rhabdomyosarcoma. I did some did research that indicated that sarcoma is only constituted about three to four percent of new cancer diagnoses yearly. So with that in mind, how rare was what what you were did you have that you were diagnosed with? Super rare. Absolutely super rare um, and super aggressive. Sarcomas are aggressive. Yep. My understanding they have to be caught early. Yeah. Well, I mean, early detection definitely saves lives yeah. and the earlier you catch it. So listening and developing a relationship with your body and learning its signals as soon as possible can save your life. It literally saved my life because I listened to what my body was saying. I followed up on what my body was saying. And fortunately for me, I had a very wonderful gynecologist. She's like, OK, so this is what we just did. These are the results. The next step would be, do you want to proceed? There was no, like, I didn't have to fight her at all. Mm -hmm. I had to fight my insurance a little bit, but I didn't have to fight her at all. And that, when you have a doctor like that, that don't leave, <laughs> keep, keep the doctors like that. That's, that's what we should all have. We should all have doctors like that, that support us and allow us to be part of the process. Yeah, it's empowering and collaborative, and that's what I think individuals who are facing a terminal illness or a, term, a terminal diagnosis need is empowerment and collaboration. Uh, yes. Be, yes. Because getting that diagnosis is losing losing an individual to a terminal illness is disempowering. Can, the, the grief in the aftermath can be disempowering. Getting that type of diagnosis is disempower, can be disempowering. And it's good that you had an oncologist that gave you options, allowed you to collaborate with her on treatment, and really honored your input. 
Well, she was my gynecologist. I ended up with a, a whole host of, of other doctors. Uh, I had uh, I had the oncologist and then I had the radiation oncologist. And yeah. it, it was a lot and it was a little overwhelming. I ended up creating a medical binder um, notebook that I put all my appointments in. I put all of I listed out all of the medications I was on. Anytime I would go to lab, I would put all of that information in there because they're always asking about stuff like, you know, what, what did so-and-so say? So I would pull out the binder and I would open it up and like, so-and-so said this, this, this is what doctor, you know, said, and this doctor over here said this. And when you are transitioning in, in a journey like this, they, they talk about chemo fog or chemo brain. I would eat the same thing for breakfast and I still couldn't tell you what I had eaten because you lose a lot. And I, at, <laughs> in March, I will be celebrating my 17th anniversary, And uh, there are still times where my brain will stutter. Like I just say I'm buffering. And I believe that I have gotten not, not as smart as I used to be like the, the brain doesn't function the way it does. And it's not something that they talk about a lot in regards to side effects. Honestly, they don't really talk a lot about the side effects. I mean, you get a form and as you sign before they do procedures mm -hmm. and stuff, but they don't really discuss with you some of the side effects that you, you can have. Um, I don't have any front teeth because of radiation. This is fake. I love it, but... Um, they don't talk about any kind of potential sexual dysfunction you can have. They don't talk about because they irradiate your abdomen, you might poop yourself in public. I call them poop sedents. There are so many different side effects that you wouldn't even think are related to your treatment plan. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's very fascinating. And they're starting to now actually look into that and talk to survivors and ask about th those things. I mean, skin issues, radiation burns and, mm -hmm. and rashes, and they don't talk about that. Yeah, sometimes you wonder what's worse, the, the, the actual cancer itself or the treatment for it. I was really blessed. I did not have a lot of horrible side effects other than no energy whatsoever. I, I I was sleeping 20 hours a day. I was literally a giant cat. I would sleep most of the day and then I would go do my treatments. I would do everything I could to keep my spirits up. I would put my feet, touch grass. I would literally touch grass because when you ground, when you put your bare feet on the ground for seven minutes a day, your body regulates and you release the i don't know if it's positive or negative electrical charges i haven't figured that part out yet i've been told but i keep forgetting and it's okay you, you regulate mm -hmm. and it only takes seven minutes there's so much that you can do in a holistic way to make the experience of surgery chemotherapy and radiation less hard because it's it's brutal yeah, definitely. From witnessing that with, with my own daughter, it was a very you know, brutal, challenging series of treatments that she went through. It was challenging for her. It was challenging for, for us witnessing that. Um, and, you know, it was something that I can, I can still, 20, almost 21 years later, I can remember certain aspects of her treatment that are ingrained in my head. Um, and and they, they always will be, as somebody who has been on both sides. Huh? Like as supporter of somebody going through cancer, because according to the American Cancer Society, one in every two people will have some form of cancer before they die. That's the current statistic. When I was diagnosed 17 years ago, it was one in three. Mm -hmm. It's not going in the correct direction. But as somebody who has been on both sides of, of that fence, I feel that being the supporter is harder. Because you, you feel helpless. You yeah. can't do anything for the loved one. And 
that's how you feel, but that's not how they feel. Like have conversations with your survivors because communication is absolutely essential when you want to help them. Ask them what they need. How, how can you support them? Because the number one question that I get asked is, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say. Well, it's going to be different for each survivor. And you will fill a different role based on how they mm-hmm. interact with you. You might be the one that comes to pick them up and, and, and drives them around so that they can look at something other than the four walls. You might be the person that they call up so that they can rage to and, and, and cry and be upset about the fact that they have this diagnosis. You might be the one that they call and ask you to bring over something to eat and a movie. So it, it is different for every, every relationship and every survivor. So just communicate. Yeah, and, and, and ask them what, what you can do to help. Make some suggestions, you know, in in this yes. that that may trigger some. Oh, geez, I should have. I didn't think about that. Yeah, I could, I could use that. So, um, but you, yes, it, exactly. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but exactly because, as I said, chemo brain is a real thing, and you don't necessarily know the support that you need until you have a conversation about it with somebody, and then if you're making suggestions, you know, like would you like me to make you a casserole? And they'd be like, no, I don't really want a casserole, but I really, really, I want a pizza. And I think I'll eat that. When you're going through this kind of journey, any food that you'll put in your, in your mouth is fantastic, but you want to eat healthier things because that, that will support your body better. But something is better than nothing. That's right. Yeah, yeah, especially when you look at the fact that one of the side effects of chemo is weight loss, and you know also the, the extreme nausea that becomes cumulative after each chemo treatment also you know disrupts appetite as well too. So anything that they have a taste for that they can get any kind of nourishment, go for it. Exactly, that is precisely my point. However, if if you can eat healthy foods then that's what you should be eating. Organic is better. Eat your vegetables and your protein, less carbs. Um, and if you can, stay away from the sugar because the sugar feeds the cancer. Yeah. So you want to stay away from that. But, you know, do your absolute best. Yeah. So, yeah, it's essentially being mindful of also what's going into your body. Um, if you can. If you can. So. A thousand percent transparency. When I was going through my cancer journey, I did not fix my nutrition. I've started to do that in the last couple of years. I've lost 75 pounds. I'm the healthiest I have ever been. But while I was going through it, I did not. I ate what I what I ate Mm -hmm. because it was familiar to me and I had a taste for it. But I fixed a whole bunch of other stuff. I added Reiki and crystal singing bowls and flower essences. And I did have a conversation with my oncologist. I said, I want to do all of these alternative modalities. And the only thing that he said no to was herbs, herbal supplements, Mm -hmm. because they could counteract the chemotherapy. And I'm thinking to myself, well, that's what I want to do because it is so much, Mm -hmm. this crazy stuff. Um, There were different kinds of chemotherapy there are different kinds of drugs um and they all act differently some of them are way more toxic than others and there's one called cisplatin which is the the drug that that they use for me it is so toxic that they had to give me rescue drugs before during and after the chemotherapy and because of that my chemotherapy was inpatient because if you are hooked up to the iv for longer than 12 hours they have to keep you there overnight. Yeah. I think it's 12 hours. I'm not sure. And then I, so my, my chemotherapy was uh, four days a month. I was inpatient and they would every day pump me full of the rescue drugs and the cisplatin. And then I would have the rest of the, the month off and then they would do it again. Mm-hmm. My oncologist gave me what he called a chemo radiation sandwich. So there was three treatments of chemotherapy 
a short break and then five and a half weeks of radiation and then a short break and then three more chemotherapy treatments. So from, from the time I was diagnosed into the time I was released back into the wild was about 10 months. Now, one of the things I know you talked about a lot of holistic practices that you engaged in that were very key to your, to recover your recovery. As far as your mindset, what were the components of your mindset in addition to the holistic therapies that allowed you to, to really go from, from terminal to thriving in the aftermath of your challenges with cancer? Tell us a little bit about that. I, I, I certainly will. So um, for me, every day when I got up, when I changed my underwear, I visualized that I, when I was putting my underwear on, I visualized that they were Wonder Woman's underwear because for me, Wonder Woman doesn't die. And that was the physical representation of me actively deciding to live every day. And this was far, far before I read books like Alter Ego and things like that. There are studies that if you do a Superman pose before you go and do a presentation, if you just stand in that, po you just standing in that pose, visualizing that you're you're Superman or or Batman, just pick a superhero pose. You do it for a minute, your confidence is increased so much. There are studies that talk about if you're if you're angry or depressed, how it suppresses your immune system mm -hmm. by like eighty percent for five hours, six hours. So, putting yourself in a positive mindset. I don't mean toxic positivity, but I mean active, act, active happiness. Like be grateful for the things that you do have. Be grateful for the family that's helping you through this. Be grateful for your medical team. Be grateful that you got to wake up that day. Be grateful that you're able to eat. And these little gratitudes really do build up. And you can find a weird kind of joy while you're going through this journey. It's rough. I, like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to lie. I, you know, it, it was not easy. And right now I, I am having another cancer concern and I have to go in and have a breast biopsy in a few weeks. And we're working on breath work and meditation and being productive in our time so that the, the mind gremlins don't, you know, start chattering. But again, with the, you know, I am a healthy person and just telling the universe that you will accept nothing less. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that that's that's a little bit about how I how I walk through that. That's a big part, I think, of anybody's journey to visualize positive outcomes to do positive affirmations, to do meditations. I think like particularly the protective meditations, like the white light meditations that will yeah. protect you during times of uncertainty, during times where our fear tends to sometimes be greater than our faith. And that does happen living the human experience. That is going to happen. But we always yeah. know that we have those tools to fall back on to get ourselves regrounded. I also like the fact that you, you talked about getting in touch with Mother Earth, because that is so important to feel the earth under your feet and also to visualize that your feet are like, can transform into giant roots that just go right into the, to the, into the center of the earth that just keep you grounded and strong. That's actually one of my favorite kind of meditations where you sit on the ground and you become the tree and the roots come out of your, your body into the ground and then you raise your arms and you have, you extend to the sky. So you become the bridge between the, the earth and the sky mm -hmm. and you just let the beautiful light go both ways and just the healing, beautiful white light. Yes. Fantastic. It, it's one of my favorite meditation and I, I recommend it to everybody, right? Um, something else like colors. So there are two colors that are very healing. One is green mm -hmm. and the other is blue. Green also promotes growth, which is why I, I, I stayed away from a lot of the greens and really embrace blue with everything. Now, for our listeners who may not know, what is the significance 
of the blue color, spiritually, practically, or otherwise? It, it's a healing color. It, it promotes healing. That's what blue does. And also, uh, blue also does calm and, and peace. Green is growth and, and financial abundance. White is purity. Mm-hmm. And I also remember, also green, I think, could be associated with, with being out in nature, depending on which interpretation of green that you read or colors that you read. But I also attribute green to kind of being associated with being out in nature and having that peaceful, calming effect by being out in the great outdoors. Well, the Japanese call it forest bathing. Yep. When you just go out and, and you just have a bath in the forest, there is something about how the energy works with the energy of your body there there's that beautiful exchange and you, the air smells clean and you you just feel different when you are in the forest yeah i think it's like when i've been out in nature it's like any of the the worries of the day the stressors of the day they just seem to dissipate and yes you know sitting in the quiet with just myself quieting my mind, it just, in that silence, I get clarity about you know, what I need to do, where I need to go. I think research has shown that even being out in nature for a half an hour has calming effects. It reduces anxiety, improves mood. We weren't really meant to be indoors. No. <laughs> no, we weren't meant to be tied to phones or tablets or video games. We were meant to be in the great outdoors. And we were, yeah. we were meant to be children of nature. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Mm-hmm. And I would love to talk about the, 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 the power of m- mushrooms, powdered, powdered mushrooms. And so many of the different mushrooms like cordyceps and turkey tail and reishi, they all have different anti-cancerous properties. I'm not giving medical advice, but you can do some research and you, you can, you can see what what herbs and mushrooms are helpful in that and you can make your own versions of uh i hot cocoa right like so i i make a blend it has cordyceps um the other c1 lion's mane and reishi and then it has turmeric and then it has all of the things that are in a masala chai the the black pepper the cinnamon the nutmeg the cardamom the cloves just a little bit all that and and some cacao powder and you you have a beautiful hot chocolate that doesn't taste like mushrooms it tastes like hot chocolate it's a little different but it's delicious and it's healthy it you know it's it's, uh, it prevents you know it's a preventative measure against cancer it's it can and turmeric is a supplement that I take regularly because I know it's a great anti-inflammatory. And yes. if there's a correlation, I believe, between an inflammation and also the onset of certain cancers as well, too. So I, I, I believe there is a correlation between inflammation and any disease. Yep. Yep. That's my personal mm-hmm. opinion. Again, not medical advice, but if you if you look the you you can you can see like arthritis is 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 inflammation like it just and i think that if you understand that and start eating foods because food is medicine if you start eating foods that reduce the inflammation instead of increase inflammation you will find immediate results in your body and how it functions mm-hmm. Absolutely. And, and I think what we put into our body dictates in, in part the quality of our life as well, too. And, yeah. and I've learned that in my 60s that, um, and like you, I mean, I, for me, I, was, I, had the, I battled my weight for most of all of my life. And then there got to be a point where I, I hit a turning point about two and a half years ago where I said, I can't do this anymore. I was up to 252 pounds. Um, I went on Noom. I reestablished new relationships with food. Um, I changed my mindset around that, and I've lost over 70 pounds, and I've kept it off. And 
in my 60s, I feel better than I ever did in my 30s because it's commitment to that, to mind body health and also being mindful of the foods I'm putting into my system and what I'm eating and, and how much I'm eating. And um, it's made a difference for me. I, it, well, yeah, I definitely feel uh, more healthy now than I do it, did at 38 because 38 is the year I got to <laughs> I'm now in, in my in my mid fifties and I feel absolutely fantastic. Uh, I have kept off the 70 some odd pounds that I've lost. It, it was part, it was mind, mindset and it was small incremental changes. First yeah. we stopped drinking soda and then we went from a dinner size plate to a lunch size plate. And then we stopped putting lots of white bread type things on the plate and start putting 75% vegetable matter and the rest is uh, proteins and fats. And then it went to no second servings on our little lunch plate. And my, my stomach has shrank. And for somebody who battled weight my entire life, for some reason it clicked this time. And I, I, Actually, like I was walking through my kitchen and I heard a visible click, um, something about the way that my pants touched the back of my leg. And I was like, oh, I'm a slender woman now. And it just I I see myself as slender. I feel mm -hmm. slender. I have three or four X the stamina that I did a couple of years ago. It's amazing. And congratulations. And your uh, your weight loss and your healthy lifestyle commitment, and the other you too. Well, thank you. And the other thing is that you will be in my thoughts, you know, with, with going through the biopsy, and I will you. send positive vibes out to the universe that the results are negative for cancer. They're going to be fine. Yep, yep. And they're going to be fine. Yep. So, with your permission, I'll send those positive thoughts out. Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. I always welcome positive thoughts and prayers. Me too. Me too. According to your, what I saw on your website, you studied herbs for over 30 years and you're a certified aromatherapist. That's correct. So, and also a Reiki master. A Reiki master. So, has there been any research done on how herbal and aromatherapy can improve healthcare outcomes? Have you seen so, any of that? Uh, the way that our healthcare system is designed right now, they really don't promote that because it doesn't, it doesn't make any money. You know, you, you can't trademark any herbs. Mm -hmm. So, so getting that kind of information is difficult. There, there are some studies on, on PubMed that you can find where they are, um, what was it recently? Uh, there was a, uh, a, a vibration, sound vibration to destroy certain kinds of tumors was just FDA approved. So it's slow in coming. And they're, you know, they're going to focus on the, the pieces that they can make money off of. But you hear stories about how people go and do things. Like, like I survived something that only a 5% chance of survival. And I honestly believe 95% of that is the mindset and the rest of it, obviously the medical team and all of that played its part. But I also believe that grounding and Reiki and uh, aromatherapy and detoxifying baths and all of the other modalities that I included in it, I feel all of that because for me, mind, body, spirit, you need to heal the entire being and not just focus on treating the symptoms of the thing. Mm -hmm. Tell us how that informs your coaching practice with clients who request your services in terms of what strategies do you employ? with individuals who are navigating the challenges presented by life-threatening illness. How do you impart what you've learned to them? Well, first we start with a conversation and they tell me 
what they're going through, how they feel. And then we, we start with mindset and nutrition because they're, they're right here, right at top. And what kind of relationships they have, like, do they have toxic people that they need to excuse from their life? Or do they have a supportive network? Because you have to have your family, friends, and your medical team all in alignment with the fact that you're going to kick cancer's ass. That's, that's just how it has to be. And then we sit and we have a discussion where they intuitively choose their wellness blueprint based on how they feel about specific modalities, right? Like if I say something to you and you're like, well, clearly your body has just told you that you're not interested in working with that modality. So we'll, we'll pick a different one. Some people don't like the idea of Reiki. They think energy healing sounds a little hokey, but they're really okay with, with herbal teas or aromatherapy. So for each person, we develop a, a specific blueprint for them. And then I work one-on-one -on -one with them over the, the months as much as they, as much as they want, honestly. And I think it's good that not only do you collaborate, but you empower them to dictate the frequency because depending, mm. depending on where they're, they're at with, they're at with everything, they may need to take a break occasionally, depending on what their, their mindset is, depending on what else is going on in their lives. And it's, yep. it's great that you allow space for that and that there's a lot of oh, you have flexibility. To. Oh yeah. Yep. Everybody, everybody is going to heal their own way. Everybody is going to need different things. So I work with them to decide what those are, but they're making the decision. I'm just facilitating it. But, and for me, the way you do that, if I were a client of yours, you would be giving me the message that, look, this isn't just a short-term fix. I, no. I am in this with you for the long haul, for yep. however long it's going to take. You are going to be empowered to do your treatment as you see fit when you see fit, those messages either implied or stated to me can just jumpstart a person's road to recovery because yeah. that, that's got to make them feel empowered. Empowered. I want to say empowered, special, like you know, you're treating them as if they are the only person in the world at that moment with their needs. Because they are. Because they are. If the reason that I do this is if I can help even one person not endure some of the, the, the horrible aspects of my cancer journey because I help them be informed. And there's a lot of stuff that is common sense. And I'll, and I'll talk about this real quick. So you're going to lose your hair. Okay. So we, we have hair, right? So I had a mohawk. And the day before I went in for my first round of chemo, we shaved off the rest of the, my, my mouth up and we went in and I, I had four days of chemotherapy and I came home and the first thing I did was take a shower. Well, in my shower, I lost all of my pubic hair in my hand. And then I had a, a 45 minute meltdown in my tub because yes, Tanya, you're going to lose your hair. And I, Common sense. Yes, you have hair all over your body, but like it didn't occur to me as a smart person, it didn't occur to me that I would lose other hair. This is not the only hair that you have. And so if me talking about that tells somebody else that they might want to shave themselves in other places, like I I kept hair in weird spots, like chin hair. Hey, when you're going through a cancer battle, there's no, the rules, conventional wisdom goes out the window. You do whatever you need to do, grow hair wherever you need to grow it, and it's going to stay. Right. So, but like, as, as a woman, it is especially hard to lose your hair. Yep. Yep. And that's something that I talk to my clients about too. Some people prefer to just, I, I'm just going to shave and go bald and just, just be. And others are like, nobody can know. And then they're going to wear all the beautiful wigs and everybody is different. Everybody wants to do it different. I wore a different color wig from the Halloween store every day because I wanted to promote awareness of, you know, you never know who is, who is going through a journey at, at, at any given time. So 
I would go into each of my radiation appointments and I would have a different color wig on and the uh, office staff started betting on what the color was going to be. So that's how I found some humor in in my cancer was was because I feel that humor goes a very long way. Mm -hmm. And some of it was, you know, that deathbed humor because because where you where I was at the time, right? You know, so yeah, and I think sometimes if you didn't laugh or show a little humor, you'd probably be crying. And I think that's yes, all, that that's that all. happened too. You embrace the entire emotional spectrum when you go through life challenges. And what I've learned over the years, and I didn't learn it as I was going through it early, Tanya, with with my daughter's transition. But I learned it after is that every emotion has something to teach us. Every emotion is important, good or bad, and bad, is important for us to develop genuineness. And happiness isn't the only key to fulfillment. There are facets of happiness. There are other emotions that aren't happiness that can also teach us a lot about life if we let it. And, um, you know, when you're mentioning one of the toughest things for a woman is losing their hair. It brought me back to when my, my daughter, and she knew she was going to lose her hair with the chemo. So she shaved her, she shaved it all off. And I remember having to take her to get a wig. And that was one of the most difficult things that I had to do. And I think that she had to go through because one of the things she was so proud of was her hair. And she had a beautiful head of hair. And the other thing that I think this brings up is that there are associated losses for individual going through cancer treatment, the loss of their hair, the loss of physicality, the loss of, 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 of energy. There's a lot of associated losses that go along with it that are also being grieved and, and dealt with in addition to worrying about, am I going to live or am I going to die? Yes. When, when you're diagnosed with uh, cancer on any of your, uh, so your uterus defines you as a woman in this society. So when they take that out, after you go through your cancer journey, then you, then you have, you grieve the loss of your, your motherhood phase. Mm -hmm. You grieve the loss of your potential offspring. You grieve the loss. Like I didn't want kids until the second they took out the uterus. So I know that like it was just because I couldn't anymore. God works mysteriously. I met a man with three kids, so I do have kids and but I did I've never birthed a child. And then I had to have a reconnecting with the divine feminine and to to really feel like a woman again because one of my friends put it very succinctly when he said, of course you're having problems. The the thing that defines you as a woman tried to murder you. <laughs> yes. And and that's something that they don't talk about. And even with that loss, when I talk to survivors that have gone through mastectomies, I'm like, I feel like I got off so easy because a mastectomy is a, so visual, right? Like my, my scar is barely visible, but what was taken from me was from the inside, right? Having an amputation of your breast, like I can't even conceive. And these, these warriors just walk around and they have these beautiful tattoos or they, or they do implants or they do, you know, they move fat from parts of their body to, to reconstruct the breast. It, it's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. And one of the things that I have found to be super inspiring is the human adaptability, mm -hmm. the just the the courage and the strength. I like strength is the wrong word. Like be strong. No, we're resilient, right? Like, because nobody wants to do this, right? But the tenacity to just keep going through one of the hardest things you're going to have to do as a person. 
And you're certainly a testament to the resiliency of the human spirit and the will of the human spirit with your your own um, challenges, the way you rose to those challenges to, with, with a cancer that had a survival rate of 5%. And I, I, I'm just glad that you are here doing what you are doing. Um, and as we're getting ready to wrap up, I got a couple of more questions for you. First of all, give our listeners and our audience one or two takeaways from your life experiences that can help them transcend their life challenges. So the, the quote, whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. I, I feel that that uh, sums it up very succinctly, right? So if, if, you, if you allow the diagnosis to just kill you, like, because there are people that just accept it and, and, and they're like, oh, I'm going to die. And then they let it take them. And then there are other people that are like, oh, no, I don't like that. I'm going to fight tooth and nail. Whether I win or lose that battle, I, I'm, I'm prepared to fight for my life. And so you cannot control the situation. All you can control is how you respond to it. I like that. And lastly, if people want to get in touch with you, find out more about what you do, find out about your services or anything else that you have going on, what's the best way for them to do that, Tanya? The best way for them to do that is to go to my link tree, which is L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E slash power pantaloons, power P-O-W-E-R and pantaloons, P A N T. L O O N S. Now, Power Pantaloons, that's your podcast as well, too, correct? Yes, that's the name of the podcast. Yes, which can be found on YouTube. Perfect. Perfect. I like the name of that, by the way, too. Power Well, Pantaloons. because it's after Wonder Woman's Pantaloons. I love it. I love it. And that, that's always going to remind you of, of one of the elements that helped you get through from thriving to surviving to, of, uh, doing what you're doing, which is a wonderfully meaningful work. So thank you, Tanya. It has been an absolute pleasure having you on the teaching journeys podcast. I hope we can do this again sometime. Absolutely. Dave, anytime. I really appreciate you inviting me on. You're thank you. You're welcome. And with that, that is a wrap on another episode of the teaching journeys podcast. I'm your host, Dave Roberts, wishing you peace. <laughs>